Oh, so welcome to this new NBS Academy uh, webinar. Uh, today we'll um, continue our series about NIME. So last week, um, our speakers, Jan and Stefan, introduced you to uh, the concept uh, behind NIMES and how to, to use it. And they gave you some links to some exercise. So today that will be the, the topic of, uh, of this webinar. And uh, again, for today, we have Jan from uh, FMI and Stefan from NIME. And we're pleased to uh, welcome also uh, Franca from FMI uh, as a one moderator uh, for today's session. With that, uh, I leave the floor to uh, our guests. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction and welcome back everybody for the second session. Let me just share my screen now. All right. <clears throat> so, now, uh, today is part two of this introduction to NIME for image processing. Uh, just a brief recap and some follow ups from the last session. Um, we last, last time we walked through an image processing workflow for, for image segmentation. And basically, we, we saw that uh, NIME image processing allows the building of more or less complex image analysis pipelines and makes also debugging very easily because you can really uh, see the intermediate result of, the, uh, of, of each of the nodes in the, in the workflow. And of course, we can also easily adapt workflows uh, because it's a very modular system and batch processing is built in into the workflows. And the possibility to add annotations to, to nodes and also workflow uh, annotations is, is really helping with the, the embedded documentation of whatever you do in, in your data science and image analysis workflows. So it's a very useful tool for reproducible science. And um, with that, we'll, we'll, we'll dive in, in in a few more aspects of that for today. But before uh, going into more details, I would like to uh, point you to the possibility of learning um, on and, and on some online resources. You have already heard about the NIME hub that we were mentioning last time. So on hub.nime.com, you can search for um, existing workflows, for exa examples. You can also look for the components and nodes that are available. And um, maybe just to mention that in the NIME uh, analytics platform, you have direct access to the NIME hub if you have an, uh, an account there, but you can also go to the example server here in the left part of your NIME Explorer. If you double click here, it will open the list of example workflows that you can browse and see. In particular, the image processing workflows are under the community uh, part, and then image processing, you find a number of workflows that are tutorials for a few nodes, and some applications, uh, specific workflows for the integrations that are available. So the ImageJ cell profiler integrations and the NiPython extensions, um, not just noteworthy, and a few uh, highlighted applications such as TrekMate, for example, and the other one here in the list. So I would encourage you to just use these examples as a learning resource as well. And of course, uh, use this, the search and also ask uh, questions, both on the Image SC forum uh, that is known to most bioimage analysts, and uh, also on the NIME forum when it's more for um, technical questions about uh, the core functionality of NIME. But both forums, so Image SC and NIME forum, are are fine for any questions with image processing NIME workflows. All right, uh, sorry for. For this, um, I would now jump to the assignment that we gave at the end of the last session. So here are the links again uh, of the assignment workflow online. You can download it as an archive or just go to the hub and download it from there. And given the webinar format, we of course cannot make it fully interactive that you can uh, hands on cl click, click it with us together, but I will walk through a solution or a proposal of a solution now with you direct interactively in, in NIME. 
So let's switch to the assignment workflow. Do you see that? Yes. Yeah, okay. And for some reason there's, my zoom is blocking here, the screen. Okay. Can't reach the the zoom window here. Shift it. Okay. All right. So in the in this workflow assignment, uh, the task was to load some images and then do some segmentation, uh, similar to the workflow we have been walking through last week already. So I will be rather quick in the in the beginning, and then focus on the task of measuring the image intensities in our segmented objects. So first of all, I will now start with the node repository and the workflow coach here and use a path to string node to convert the lists, listed paths in here that, I, that we see are pointing to six files out of our data file folder. And we're just converting them to a string variable in order to be able to load them with the image reader node. So, so far that was uh, the same that we had done last week already. So if I double click the image reader table, there's not much uh, I need to change on the configuration as it is. It will just read in the six images. If I execute and open views, it will open an image reader an image viewer, sorry, and showing me the six images that are being read. These are two channel images. If you have followed the assignment, you will know that. And we want to go, so if, if I click on one of those here, we can see uh, these are, this is channel one and the other one is channel two. And the goal is to segment the single nuclei and then measure their intensity in the second channel. So first of all, I would like to split the image in the two channels. I'm using this splitter from the image processing extension, which when executed will just give me a new column for every channel. So I have two different columns now for each image. There's uh, channel one and channel two. Now for the actual segmentation, as highlighted in the annotation here, we will go for um, a simple thresholding workflow first, which is uh, a small smoothing, then uh, global thresholding. We would like to fill holes in this thresholded images and then um, do a connected component analysis to generate the actual labeling image. So um, if you look at this, um, at the workflow code, in case you have activated it in your installation as well, uh, we can actually quickly find these things in the top hits of this workflow coach. So what we need now, we want to do a smoothing. So you need the Gaussian convolution here. Then after this one, um, I need to activate it again then, uh, it suggests the global thresholder, which is exactly the one that we want to have here. And then uh, when I click here, uh, the next thing would be either a connected component analysis or the second uh, place here is fill holes, which is exactly what we want to do on the binary image before doing the connected component analysis. So I can yet take this one and after filling holes, I will directly jump to the connected component analysis. So now let's see what these nodes actually do step by step. So the Gaussian convolution, I will double click to configure this one. Uh, I will leave it with the default settings with only like a, a sigma and two in both X and Y dimensions. And for the column selection tab, this is where I have to choose which channel we want to process. So in this case, I will only select our first channel here. 
and click OK. So if you uh, look at this, if we want to see the intermediate results, this is how it should look like. So in general, the nuclei are still distinguishable, but a bit smoothed, smoothened out. And um, so we can more easily apply a threshold in the next step. For the global thresholder, I will switch to uh, a yen threshold here and just press OK. And this will give us a binary image for the whole set of six images. We will have now a black and white mask image of these cells. Now we said, because some of those might con still contain holes, we use this fill holes node, which basically just gives uh, the option to select in what dimensions we want to fill the hole. So and if you keep it to X and Y uh, for, for 2D images, of course, that's all we can do. For 3D image, you could also choose to select um, different dimensionalities here. So this will give us the binary image without holes in the single components. That looks good. So now we will just do a connected component analysis. We can run this right away. <clears throat> and it will give us this uh, new, a new image type called uh, segmentation or labeling indicated by this SEG column header here. Uh, which contains all the labels. If you look at these, um, you will see random colors for each separated object. If we mouse over this, uh, these colors, you will see up here, uh, we have a value equals and then this indicator of the label, which is just different numbers in our case. <clears throat> all right. So of course, if we look here, you will see that also some of these, uh, because we did a plain connected component analysis, the cells that are touching, they are not segmented optimally. For now, we will leave it like that. I'll just talk in a minute about uh, other approaches that we can use here, of course. Um, <clears throat> so now that's basically the segmentation. Yeah, there's actually a question from the audience about this, um, whether, yes. whether there's a, a way to use watershed segmentation. Um, I think yes. we will address this in a second, right? Uh, I will address it. Yes, thank you. I will address that in a second. We can actually use, for example, ImageJ macros to do that. And ImageJ has a nice watershed implementation that we can use. I will show that in a minute. And uh, of course, we can also replace this segmentation by more complex uh, segmentation approaches, which we will see also later uh, in this seminar. So for now, if I look at the image viewer, I basically have that uh, that single column now with my segmentation because the name is still a bit cryptic uh, of this uh, image and then the channel ident identifiers here. I will just rename my column to something more readable. So I use a column rename node. By double clicking on it, it will be always added to the workflow and I will choose this column and then just name it segmentation, for example. All right. So that's the first part of the segmentation. Now, uh, the more tricky part is to get to the actual measurements of intensities. So we first need to join back this segmentation with our split channels from the splitter here. And then at the second step, we will need a node that measures intensities. For now, I will just take a joiner to merge back all the columns that I want to have. So I will take the original images from, from here, from the splitter. Let me just make that a bit small, uh, a bit larger. And then take the joiner. When we 
have to configure the joiner, we will always have to choose a matching criterion. And in this case, it's just row ID and row ID from, the bo from both of the tables we join. So um, since they didn't change row IDs in our whole workflow, the first row will be still the first row in this one. So the joiner will just merge the, channel, the, the columns together. If we see that here, we now have the two separated channels in, uh, from, from the first table together with, this, with the respective segmentation of the first channel for each of the table rows. Now there is a, a new node that I need to introduce for the, for the measurement of the features. It's called image segment features here. And this one allows us to, to choose an, an input image with intensities like the first channel and a segmentation image, which defines these segments or objects. So if I configure this one, I can choose a segmentation here and I can choose an image column from our two channels. So I will just leave it with the, I, I will choose the second channel here because we are interested in the intensity measurements from that second channel. So keep in mind, the segmentation was derived from the first channel and now we measure on a different channel. For the segment settings, there's an option where we can append uh, segment information that I will leave checked. And uh, we will also see that later we can choose uh, information about overlapping labels. That is a, is a feature that these segmentation images um, have as well. For the actual features that we want to measure, we have uh, several categories here. Uh, in the first order statistics, if you select this one, we have choices of um, different measurements of intensities, min, minimum, maximum, mean, and others statistics. So we take the mean intensity for each of the segments. That's what we want to measure on our channel two. And in addition, um, let's measure the, the size of the object, which is in, um, in segment geometry. And in here, because it's, uh, it can be area for 2D images or volume for, for 3D images, uh, it's the feature is just called numpix, so the number of pixels or voxels for if you want uh, that we measure. So that's the raw raw size of each segment of each object. If we execute this node, you will see in the output table when it's once it's done, you will see a table like this one that contains actually a black and white image of each object. Um, it, well, these ones were the, the objects at the border, that's why they're incomplete. But if you just look at some of these, so usually these bit masks are just uh, the bounding boxes for each of the cell and containing a, a, a mask of, uh, of the shape of the cell. Then we have a column called source labeling, which refers to the labeling where it came, where this segment came from. And then we have our two features that we selected here in the column numpix. Uh, we have the, the number of pixels, so in the hundreds and thousands. And for the mean, we have uh, the mean intensities of, of these objects. If you right click on the column header, so if you right click here, uh, you can also choose different renderers. For example, if you want to see it in a full precision, then it's just like a different number format. But you can also choose, uh, for example, bars, which uh, allow for an easy, uh, quick visualization of the features here. So if you have different classes in, in the table, you could easily see uh, the changes of, of these objects already maybe. So in the mean, we can also do that. Uh, next to bars, you can also, for example, uh, make it grayscale, which gives you a kind of a heat map of the features here. And can, you can browse through. So you see here already that towards the bottom of the table, it gets a little bit darker in whatever that means. Of course, you can mouse over these features and then you see the actual numbers. So that's just a very quick way of visualizing. And uh, Stefan will later on take, uh, take you on 
with a bit more ways of how to visualize this graphically. So that's so far for the actual assignment that we gave you. We measured, we extracted the area and measured the intensities of our images uh, with the segmentation from the first channel and the measurement on the second channel. Now let me switch back to the to the slides shortly. Uh, we've also put that solution in here on the NIME hub and downloadable as an as a NIME archive file. So in case you want to review that, feel free to, to download it anytime. As a follow-up on this one, I would now uh, quickly highlight some alternative segmentation methods. As I mentioned on the segmentation, we already saw that we have a few clustered cells that were not segmented by our very um, simple threshold-based segmentation. So we can improve that by uh, various ways, of course. Uh, when using extensions in NIME, we, can, um, we have an ImageJ, <coughs> sorry, an ImageJ extension that provides macro language access. So you can use any ImageJ macros in that ImageJ macro node. Um, that's one way that I will just show in a minute. In order to get these extensions, um, you have to go to your file preferences and then check, check in the uh, available software sites that you select this experimental uh, community extensions update site. So in NIME, this is file preferences. And in here, you will have these available update sites in the list where you can also add more or just check and uncheck sites from there. So if I quickly wrap this up and want to um, go to my, so if I, in the connected component analysis, we saw that we have these clustered cells from time to time because they were touching. So let's just do a simple watershed here uh, because our, our watershed image J just works on binary images. Um, oh, sorry, let me just call it for a macro. I will use this image J macro node, drag it into my workflow. And because we are working on binary images, I will have to choose the, the last node that works on a binary file here. So this fill hole, holes node, if, I, uh, if you remember, that one still has the black and white masks. So we drag this to the image J macro here. And I, if I double click here, I can add either my own code with a pure code uh, option, or I can go uh, to, to choose some pre-configured options and watershed is one of them. So if I go here and add this to my configuration dialog, you see already there's a pre-filled text here in, in the dialog, which is just the, the three line macro code. And I can as well, I again have a column selection and some other options, but for now we can just click okay here and see what it does. You might have noticed that this macro node has two outputs. If you mouse over this macro node, you will see there's processed images and there's results table. So the principle for the macro node is that it takes whatever you've defined as an input column, it makes it the current image in image J, then runs your macro on it. And the output image will be just the, the last image that is open after your macro has run and it will be fed into a new, new column. And the current results table in image J will be uh, the, the input to uh, the will be fed at the output of this uh, at the second output of this node. If I do this and run on here, and we will have a look at the result with the image viewer. And we let's look, let's have a look at these clustered cells down here again or this one as well. So you see the watershed just um, did a good job on the 2D image to separate some of these, these cells. 
So we can now take advantage of the modularity, just reconnect this output to our image uh, connected component analysis. It asks me to replace the connection and to reset the nodes. And right away, our workflow is still functional. We can do the connected component analysis and we will have separated cells in our downstream workflow here and here, you see that. <clears throat> So that's one way to enhance the, the segmentations. Um, I don't know if there's any pressing questions for that one now. Actually, um, there, there, um, the audience commented on the possibility of applying such segmentations to stacks of images in a three-dimensional framework. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. So um, image J macro, uh, th this node, also, uh, I think it allows, um, was, was there an option to, well, I just didn't remember it here. Um, so if you feed a 3D image, uh, I think, uh, so it basically feeds a stack to image J and you can just process the stack in your macro. Um, you can also do slice-wise processing or volume processing. So the, the options are um, are manifold, but of course in the macro, uh, you will be limited to what the what the image J macros does. So if your plugin works slice by slice, then that's what it uh, what it will do. Um, I don't know, Stefan. Do you want to comment? I think the yes, please. I think the question was raised a little earlier, even before the image J macro. Um, so. I Actually, I think that's that's an interesting point, changing from 2D to 3D. And if you open up the configuration dialog of the Gaussian convolution for a second, Jan, maybe that's worth pointing out here. Um, if you go to the options, exactly, you see the dimension the dimension selection here at the at the bottom of the screen, which if you open a stack of uh, three-dimensional images, basically a three-dimensional image, basically, and you have the dimension selection like this in X and Y, it will basically do a Gaussian convolution slice-wise. However, if you click the, um, the set dimension here as well, then it will automatically switch over to processing that stack instead of slice-wise, will really do a three-dimensional um, smoothing in that case. And I guess the question, so that really is you can build your pipelines on 2D and easily switch over to 3D without changing your entire workflow. That's the one point and very likely the question asker was interested in 300 sections. In that case, very likely also referring to the, the data size here. Um, honest answer, um, that will be, if you have a machine with enough memory, um, that will not be a problem. Um, but since it's really, we do a three-dimensional processing, um, we'll naively load all the slices um, into memory um, so that you might actually run into trouble there and might have to do some advanced techniques like um, loading one image after another. We might come back to that later. Yes, thanks. So there's there's options to, to get uh, either loops over the rows or even tile loops that uh, automatically cut your image into tiles and then set it put, put it back afterwards. So these options are are more advanced use cases, I would say. Then yes. Um, all right. Um, yeah. So so maybe I will just uh, now switch to one other use case uh, for. Introducing, so we, we've seen the image J1 macro. And of course, we would also like to highlight uh, more advanced segmentation techniques involving deep learning. Uh, recently, you've uh, probably heard of uh, approaches like Stardist and CellPose, which are very promising generalist model, deep learning models for, for cell or nucleus segmentation. And thanks to the nice integrations in NIME, you can also use these frameworks relatively flawlessly. I would like to highlight one example for cell pose. So that is a deep learning based segmentation method uh, recently published in Nature Method. And basically it's called from, from Python, uh, just like, uh, yeah, well, almost any other deep learning model uh, approach with either PyTorch or TensorFlow. In this 
case, uh, so you can choose from a, a, from two different uh, pre-trained model types, which are supposed to be very generalist, um, well, working well on on more, almost any type of cells. But you can also use your your own trained models, of course. I've put together an example that uh, calls cell pose via the Python integration in, in NIME. So in order to use that, you would need to install the Python integration. Uh, you can go, go to the NIME hub with the link included in these slides. And also th th then, um, well, you will have to install and restart NIME, of course. And uh, in the preferences, you will have then the opportunity to, to select to configure the Python environments. This requires uh, a Conda installation. But um, on top of that Conda installation, actually there's not so much needed. So you, do, you don't even need to set up your own Conda environment yourself, but uh, NIME provides the possibility for workflow editors to ship the environment definition with the workflow or with the component they ship on and they, they will share with you. So in our case, uh, this node uh, that is doing this work is called Conda environment propagation and it basically uh, looks at a local environment of, of you when you're developing the workflow and makes a list of the packages and keeps that uh, environment definition in the workflow configuration so we can make use of it when, when running the workflow on any other uh, computer. So in order to test this, I would like to just um, replace the essential part. So this this part is basically now my uh, my first draft of a segmentation, uh, which I will just create a new component now. Uh, I will reset this for and rename it simple segmentation. <clears throat> so now by control clicking on Windows or command clicking on, on Mac, you can always go inside this component and see the contents, which are just the six nodes that I wrapped into that component. Uh, and they are basically flagged with a, a component input and output here. So back to the parent workflow, I have this simple segmentation. Now I would like to replace or compare this seg simple segmentation with a segmentation I've put uh, as a shared solution on NIMHUB. Uh, let me quickly go to that node. I will just move in this window. So on the on the NIME hub, I've uploaded a, a component node called cell post segmentation, uh, which is basically referring to to that paper. And uh, you can just drag this icon onto your workflow. So we can take this one and drop it here, and then connect it with our output of the splitter. I, in this component node, uh, if you develop component nodes, you, there's uh, options to, to define some user input, which I've done for this uh, component node, where we can select the input column, we can se select the name for the output column, and we can also define uh, the parameters or the settings that are required for, for running the cell pose model. In this case, these are defined also on the web page of cell pose. Um, they're they're explained. So you basically have to provide an expected diameter for your objects in, in pixels and the minimum size. So 50 and 10 for them are, are okay. So I click okay here and I will let it run to do the segmentation. And in this case, if you run that on the, the first time on a computer, uh, the this Conda environment propagation node that is included in the node, it will take care to set up a new Conda environment for you if it doesn't find an environment with, this, with the name 
that is defined there that contains the correct packages. And if you run it any subsequent time and it finds that environment in your Conda installation, then of course it will uh, just go ahead and use that Conda installation. Since uh, it's just it's not using GPU, this defined Conda environment, but it just made it uh, um, a simple CPU uh, inference of the deep network. Uh, so I can run it also on notebooks like and MacBooks that don't have an NVIDIA GPU. But of course, it takes a little bit longer than it would do on a powerful workstation with GPU. Jan, can I interrupt yes. you for a second? Sure. Um, there's a question from the audience if the cell pose model type shouldn't be nucleus here. Uh, good point. Yes, I missed uh, that one. Um, actually, so when you have, uh, yeah, we can we can try both. I left it on on the cytoplasm. Uh, this, if you just have a DAPI staining or other well-defined stainings, both of them work actually good. And the recommendation from the cell pose uh, authors is actually that if the nucleus um, model doesn't work well, you can choose uh, to to use the cyto model by default. Um, it's more useful when you have two different stainings that define nuclei and, uh, and cytoplasm, and you want to basically use this, the nuclei as seeds for the cytoplasm, then you can choose between these two models. But in our, in our case, where we only use one channel, uh, both of them work equally well. And Jan, can you quickly so, explain whether you how to obtain a training or um, uh, if it's possible to train your own model? Yeah, so in this case, of course, we are, because we are using the Python integration, uh, you are, uh, as, a, as a workflow author, you can do whatever you can do in Python and just integrate it here. But um, of course, um, for, for many cases, it's usually best if you train a model on the data that you want to apply it on. In case of cell posts or Stardis, they also supply these pre-trainables that are supposed to be uh, generalist, uh, well-performing well models on on most on many data. Uh, but of course, we can also select pre uh, our own trained models. Let me just uh, click into that one with command double click. I can open the the cell post node, and we can just have a look at how it uh, works. So these green nodes actually define the user inputs that you've seen in the dialog. And this one is this Conda environment propagation. And the Python script node is actually all the, the one that is doing all the work. Uh, I don't know if I can open it without unlinking it. Yes. So that's a script that I basically put together from from the example notebook on the cell post page. It's um, running, it's creating the model and then running the, the, the model on each of the inputs in our input table. So of course, that's already a bit advanced for, for setting it up. But if you know a little bit of Python scripting, um, you can do that and basically you can transfer the, the, the code from a Python notebook into that script node. And then once uh, you have this one, uh, you, you can easily share it with others who don't need to do, go into the Python code and then they can just apply that node on your data. And your node is now called CPU because uh, it's designed for CPU usage. There's a user question um, which asks about GPU training and inference. Uh, yes, so I've, this one is, I just named it CPU because of the Conda environment because if uh, in this environment that I'm using, I only installed uh, the, the CPU version of PyTorch. So that's the only difference. And of course, also in the calling the, the cell post script, uh, you have an option to set GPU to false or true. So I, I explicitly set that to false uh, for now for the sake of being compatible across different systems. If I had, uh, if I targeted my workflow to a specific workstation where I know there's a GPU, uh, I could also define the Conda environment in a way that we directly install a PyTorch GPU version, for example. 
So it takes a little bit longer than expected here now. I wonder why that is. It took uh, like a few minutes for me when I when I tried, but maybe because of the connection now, it's a bit slower on my small laptop. So we'll take okay, so advantage of this and ask another question. Uh, the Conda environment, is it in the uh, NIME workspace or can it be elsewhere on the computer? It's actually in your uh, main Conda installation. So if you go uh, to preferences, uh, Python, where is it? NIME and Python integration. Uh, you see that I will. I pointed it on my MacBook here. I pointed it to an, to my own Mini Conda installation, and the environments are in the default path of the Mini Conda. So if I now went to the to the terminal and executed Conda, I would see that new environment created by Nime in the main list of environments. Okay, maybe for the sake of time i would also switch or hand over to stefan that he can introduce the other approach that we wanted to introduce here and um, we will just get back to the to the results in a minute maybe if that's fine with you stefan that is fine with me while i start sharing my screen one comment to um Roman's question actually about the conda environment um, so the, the idea behind that is that you can have a dedicated Conda environment for every workflow, basically. So that is really a setting on a workflow basis that you can determine, yes, my workflow requires Python and also saying, okay, th this and this package needs to be available in order to run um, this component, for instance. Um, so that's just as a, as a small remark here. Um, we were talking about alternative um, ways to segmentation already. Um, I'll jump ahead a couple of slides here. And Jan, I think you already had mentioned um, Stardist. Um, that's the part that I took a look at. I will not spare a lot of words on this here, A, because um, the authors have done an amazing job at documenting things. Um, you can really go to their um, GitHub page. The link is on the slide. Get information, links to um, publications, preprints, um, and so on, if you are interested in that. Um, so it really is, um, in short, a segmentation method, method that basically um, assumes or puts a prior on the segmentation, namely that objects that are B2 segmented, they don't have to be strictly convex, but um, star convex, um, which helps a lot with, um, for instance, examples that we have over here, um, also segmenting, overlapping, and um, touching cells here. Also, there is, there was, I don't know the exact date, but if you Google or search for Nubias Stardust. There was a Nubias Academy um, presentation in April um, last year by Martin Uwe and colleagues who've done an amazing job at um, describing what how Stardust actually works. So I'll focus a bit on the implementation and how you can use it in NIME. So one point that is also interesting here is there's the, the main GitHub repository here, that there also is a Stardust image J and um, Fiji plugin in a um, in a dedicated um, repository here. So one thing that when I saw that, I actually got quite excited um, to be able to use Stardust in NIME as well. Why is that? I mean, it only says image J and Fiji. Um, but the beautiful thing actually is with the um, image J integration, it's not only an integration for image J one macros, but um, we actually have a layer, we have functionality so that we can use um, image J plugins as nodes that really show up automatically as nodes in a NIME installation. And you briefly saw that already in, um, in Jan's node repository here. Um, if you really um, looked at the details, you'll, you saw a category that was called image J2 here. And that actually, if you take a look here, it says edit image plugins process and so on. That should sound a bit familiar to you if you've used image J um, and Fiji before because that actually is a um, categorical representation of the menu structure of image J um, and Fiji, and I should be specific here of image J2. 
um, inside of your G. And for instance, we do have a um, Gaussian blur entry here that, for example, shows up here as a node in the filters category. I can really take it, drag and drop it as a node into the into a NIME workflow, and it really uses exactly the same underlying implementation as it would use in an image shade two. It automatically um, derives the configuration dialog for those um, plugins or commands, as they're also called, um, from the parameter definitions of the plugins. We can also um, set the, the sigma, the radius for Gaussian blur, for instance, here in the configuration dialog. So we'll also do a mapping of usage concepts um, onto, uh, um, onto NIME. So interactively selecting parameters um, will be translated into a configuration dialog on a node. And why that got me so excited actually is that it's not only the regular image J2 plugins that are shipped, but you can also integrate custom image J2 plugins that then show up as um, nodes in your um, in your NIME installations. Really, if you go in and have implemented um, some um, image J2 plugins, like this one, I think was really implemented by by Jan. Um, at the at the FMI, you define your parameters um, and you will do the implementation. Um, you implement once, you can use it in image JFG, but you can also um, use it inside of NIME. Um, how do you do that practically? There is, Jan already showed that, there's a, um, in the preferences, there is a, um, if you open up the preferences, NIME image processing plugin, and there's an image to image J2 plugin installation, you can click add here and um, manually add custom jar files with um, image J plugins for use in your NIME installation. Beware that you have to restart your NIME um, once before they um, show up in your node repository. And with that, I actually thought, well, that's amazing. We do have a start this image share plugin. I can just one-to-one um, want to, want to just use it um, inside of NIME. Unfortunately, that didn't work out 100% yet. Um, however, um, the, the interesting part is Stardist is a deep learning based um, method. And we actually can also use and have native um, integrations of deep learning in NIME. So there's a couple of those integrations with um, popular frameworks like Keras, TensorFlow, um, Onyx, which is a, also a, a cross platform um, standard basically, um, also deep learning um, for J. So the nice thing about that is, or the two things that I want to point out that are really particularly nice about that is that you can actually build the topology of a deep learning um, of network with nine nodes, with those Keras layer nodes, for instance. However, you don't actually have to use that. You can, you see that as an example down here, you can use Python and the Keras Python API to define, um, to define your network in such a node here and then even use this topology and manually add nodes in here, take a Keras network, convert, convert it to a TensorFlow network, and then use the native um, TensorFlow execution to actually um, take the network and use it um, for prediction. Why is that so interesting? And um, the TensorFlow integration is a native integration, so it, it tends to be a bit faster than the Keras integration that uses TensorFlow in the back end. So the results should be the same, um, but the, the processing speed is a little faster with the native TensorFlow um, integration. And that's actually where I thought, well, I have all the pieces, um, all the pieces together. Um, why don't I try to put this together and build a um, Stardust um, component? And I actually um, did that. I just have to find my browser here and move that move that over um, from the NIME hub. You can actually search for Stardist. And I uploaded a component here and also an, an example workflow. Um, let's take the component here and drop it into the workflow that um, Jan has also um, built beforehand. So he used to call that a simple segmentation. For me, it's just called a segmentation. Um, the idea behind the component is again very similar. We hook it up to, um, to our input data. And in this case, I'm only using um, a two-dimensional um, Stardust model here. You can open up the configuration dialog 
um, have to select the model that we want to use for segmentation. So you can easily change this out. So this is a pre-trained model that performs quite well in uh, fluorescence images and nuclear segmentation, but you can easily switch that out and point it to a new zip file here, which is then used for segmentation. And obviously I'll have to select the image column on which to actually do the um, segmentation. Since this takes a couple of seconds to run, I will actually insert a row sampler here to not work on the um, entire data set, but only process it on one image. So now we only we see down here in the node monitor, there's only one image in our input table. And now we can give the Stardust a try and we'll see what's actually going on. Aha, uh -huh. the zip file could not be found. So that is obvious. I'll have to point it at the correct network. It should hopefully work out. Let's give it another try. Yeah, and that looks better. We can take a look at the inside of the component that looks very similar to what you what Jan showed before, a column selection node, um, a node where you can um, select the model that is applied. We do have the TensorFlow network reader in here. Interesting bit and pieces is the Tensor network um, executor that really applies um, the model here. And what is a bit particular about Stardust is that we don't actually get an, um, a pixel by pixel segmentation out of the neural network, but we do get um, the probability map and radial distance maps out here. So we'll actually have to do a bit of post-processing of the output of the neural net. And luckily that's um, where the image shape two integration comes in. Um, the authors of the image J2, uh, sorry, of the Stardust image J integration actually have provided a plugin that only does the post-processing, the non-maxima suppression, basically takes what comes out of the neural net and creates a segmentation from it or a, sorry, I actually have to take a look here and actually creates a labeling image and automatically returns that. So with that, that's actually really quite easy to just drop in the, the star disk segmentation and would now be able to also use this in our pipeline and exchange that with a cell pose and so on. So that modularity actually really is, if you're really still exploring, exploring don't know yet what is the best segmentation method, um, NIME is actually really powerful there. All right. Um, that was it about alternative um, segmentation methods. Let me move my browser over here and quickly jump back to my slides. Um, because we actually promise, or I specifically promise also on Twitter that we'll talk a bit about data analysis, not only specifically image processing. Um, so let's get to that. And take first take a step back. Jan already mentioned and showed the, the input data um, from, the, from the assignment with two, two channel images. We use one channel to do the segmentation and then are interested in extracting the intensities from the, from the second channel. However, if you've done the assignment and looked a bit at the data sets and looked at the file names, uh, them over here, you'll actually notice that there are um, two different classes that we actually have two groups um, of um, data in here. And that already hints at the explanation that Jan pointed out before that the means change as you scroll through the, um, through the results from the image segment features node, because we really do have different classes, different types of um, data in here. And this is what we're, what we're now interested in, as in we might have something like untreated cells versus treated cells in class A and class B. And we're now interested in comparing, um, comparing the features, the cell features that we extract for each group to see really is there a difference between the, between the two groups. Um, how do we do that? Or before we do that, um, let me briefly jump back a little and talk a bit about um, data, data aggregation. And again, pulling out an example that's not image related here, um, but the idea behind data aggregation is knowing that you have some, some category or groups in your data that you want to 
apply an aggregation method to um, individual groups. So sticking to, to the example here, we have an input table with a couple of um, with a product ID, we have a category in here and the number of ordered items. And an example of data aggregation would be now how many items have been ordered in total for each category. What do you do? You look at the entries for the clothing category. We have two ordered items, clothing one, clo clothing five. So you want to sum up two plus one plus five and you end up with a sum of eight in this case here. Look at your group again, home three, we only have that one, so that's directly the output. And we do again, look at the group of electronics here and sum um, those up. So that's the general idea behind data aggregation. We do have groups for which we actually um, want to take a look at the, the numbers um, inside of the groups and we want to aggregate them somehow. And the, the sum really is just an example here. It could also be in computing an average value from the individual values in each group, computing standard deviations and things like that. How is that done in NIME? There is a dedicated node for that. It's called a, the group by node. And that actually has a configuration dialogue. And let me jump over here and show you how that, how that looks live. Um, so the idea here is I actually have to add a image segment features note here so that we actually have a couple of features that we can use. Take the segmentation and the second channel and I take the features and we said we were interested in the average and the number of pixels. Say okay, execute that and take a look at the output. We now see that we actually have our individual bit masks here, the sizes and also the averages. And here our, we went in with um, six files. So one possibility for a group, for instance, would be to uh, um, look at all the cells within one file, for example. But we are actually interested in, in a second step at actually looking um, and aggregating the, all the cells that belong to class A and all these cells that belong to class B. So let's um, first take a look at the file-based aggregation. How could we do that? We do add a group by node, actually make that a bit bigger here, the group by node, take a look at the configuration. So first of all, we have to define the column um, that actually contains the group by which we want to group. In our case, Jan already mentioned that there's something like a source labeling, which actually contains the labeling image from which a cell has been extracted. Um, so we can use that as a group, for instance, and then can switch over into the manual aggregation tab over here and say, okay, for each individual image, we are, let's see for the number of pixels for the cell sizes here, we can add that. And now I have to a manually select aggregation method. What do we want to do with the individual um, with the individual numbers in here? And that actually is a drop down here. We can you see there's a lot of things that you can do. We can compute the, the average, the median, maximum, and so on. And let's say we're interested in the average cell size per image. That's basically what we're computing now. You say, okay, execute this and take a look at the group table. And now we'll actually see that in this source labeling representation that we actually have class A, let's get a bit bigger, class A image one, class A image two, class A image three, and the individual averages over the number of pixel, which basically is the average cell size um, per image in this case. So, that's, however, what I mentioned before, that's not necessarily what we're interested in. We're really interested in comparing the two classes, not comparing individual images. And there's a note that I have to, that I have to introduce here. There's a, a helper node, basically, it's called the labeling, a labeling properties node that I can use to extract the, the file name from, from a labeling. And in the configuration dialog, I actually select append and to use the source labeling. And here again, we have the features and I am interested in the, the name in this particular case, but I could also get information like the dimensionality of an image, 
number of pixels of the entire image, um, calibration, and so on. Um, just so that you've also seen that, we're only interested in the name for now. We can execute this and take a look at that results table again. So now we actually um, have the, the file name um, extracted for, um, but only one file name. And we actually have done an aggregation beforehand. So now we know the average um, cell size for um, this file. Um, let's just continue and fix our little mistake um, later because we don't want this first aggregation. Um, we'll actually use a second node. It's called a string manipulation. That is a generic nine node that you can use um, to manip manipulate and transform um, the string columns, that is text columns, basically. And in our case, we'll use that to extract the class A and class B from the file name. This is what the configuration dialog looks like. There are a couple um, of functions here, uh, very similar to the image shape macro functions, for instance. And we're looking for a function that is called the substring. And it actually, because it actually, as the name suggests, um, extracts from a string that we are providing um, from the start position, um, the length number of characters. So how do we do that? We actually double click on this and it inserts it here into the expression field. The first, um, the first parameter to the function is um, the entry in the column that we want to change, so the name column. We double click that here again. Um, how, where do I want to extract? I want to start from the very beginning of that string. And I want to extract the first um, six characters here and I will add a new column that is called the, the class. So we we'll basically do that, execute it and take a look at the output table. It becomes a bit um, easier to understand what we're doing. So for each row in here, for each cell, we're taking, we're extracting the first six characters to figure out if an image belongs to class A or an image belongs to class B. Um, now I mentioned before that we uh, actually are not interested in that on a file aggregation level, but we are actually interested in doing this for each individual cell. So let's do that. We're taking the group by here out of the loop. We're connecting the image segment features directly to the labeling properties node and the string manipulation can execute that and then take a look at the output table and we'll see okay so now for each individual cell in here we know that this cell um, with this average intensity actually came from class a and we can use that to get some descriptive statistics we can actually use our aggregation node here um, and take a look at the configuration. And now we're actually not interested in grouping by um, each file, so we move this here, but we're interested in grouping by a class. So we move that over here into the, and use that as a group column to change the, the manual aggregation and not only compute the average cell size, but let's also compute the average um, intensity per cell, basically. And say, okay, and execute this node and take a look at the output here to realize, okay, now we have two classes, class A and class B. And we see that the average cell size already is slightly different between those two classes. And here we already see that the, um, sorry, the average cell size here, but the average intensity is um, there's a huge difference between those here. This is now only one value that we have extracted for, for each group. Why don't we do it a bit more exploratively and um, take a look at the, at the box plot to also see the distribution um, between, those two, between those two groups. So we just exactly use the same data and feed it to a conditional box plot. And the condition, conditional um, in this case refers to that we want one box plot per, per group. In that case, we can hook it up to our data, take a look 
at the configuration dialog, very looks very similar to other configuration dialogs as well. We first need a category column that is our class, and we'll focus on the average intensity. And in this case, we can leave the other default values as is. Can say okay. And now actually, if we execute this node and right click on the context menu again, right here at the center of the context menu, you'll actually see that there is an entry for an interactive view of the conditional box plot. We can click on that and very similar to the, um, to the image viewer that Jan has already shown before as well, we now have an interactive um, view of the, of the input data. And here we already see that the average intensity um, is different between class A and um, class B. And then last but not least, I mean, that, that is nice already, but the question then you should ask yourself, um, is this really um, significantly different or is it different enough to um, extract um, or to do a statement about? What we can use here then is we can again use the very similar data and not um, take a look at the interactive visualization, but actually do a hypothesis test to compare if the averages of the two groups are different. So there is a... Actually, maybe Stefan, before you move on, is there, yes, a, is there a way to change the visualization? So maybe to do a violin blot instead of a box blot or something? Yes, there is. Um, I Let me check if I do have that installed. Yeah, so I do have, that's a dedicated extension, the Plotly extension, um, that adds a couple more um, visualizations. So for instance, uh, we could um, add a violin plot here. And thank you, Franka, for, for bringing that up. I do have that on the slide. If we take a look at the views here and the, the JavaScript views. Um, you will actually see that we have um, quite a few visualizations that you can use. So it's not only conditional box plot with line charts and scatter plots and, and so on. So there's a lot more visualization wise that you can actually do. Um, if you're interested, you can find a lot of examples um, on the hub or specific questions also on the forum because I mean, we've, we ran an entire course on visualizations with nine. So there's a lot more to explore here. We can try to connect that and... Maybe just one short question. So could you also um, select defined subpopulations um, for plotting? Um, so that's the violin plot, just for completeness sake. Um, mm, yes, there's two ways um, there is the, well, I would say that the naive way in quotes is that you um, filter filter out the data, for instance, or split your data before feeding it into a visualization um, into group A and group B, for example. There is, um, there's a node that's called a, a row splitter as an, as an example, where you can also define the, the rules, how to split your input data, feed the top port to visualization, the bottom port to another visualization. Um, that would be one idea how you could do that. Um, but you can also, uh, and that goes in too deep, you can also um, basically uh, create composite visualizations automatically if you put them into, into components. And we'll see that this actually should have um, a view that now contains the conditional box plot as well as the violin plot down here. And those visualizations actually can talk to each other as in it is possible to select some data in this plot up here and then only show the selected data, for instance, in the, in the plot down here. So yes, that is possible, but it's a bit more advanced concept wise, but I can put a link to the, to the documentation around that in the, in the Q and A section. Good. More questions or are we good for now? Maybe just to add as a comment. So if um, for interactive visualization, what Stefan said is, is great uh, to, in, in, to have in NIME, 
um, if you already have some some script, for example, in R for doing your own scientific uh, visualization, you can also use the R integration and then basically just feed the table into your into that R script and use ggplot2, for example, to generate a static uh, plot or the same with the Python view uh, when you have uh, plotly uh, scripts, for example. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, thank you very much. And that's that's indeed a very good point. All right, I don't have the R extension installed, so I can't show that. So you only saw the Python um, version now. Okay, um, where was I? Um, is the, the difference in the mean actually statistically significant? Um, we would use a, a student's t-test or an independent group's t-test. That's what we call it um, in that case. There's a note for that, um, as there are a couple of other um, hypothesis tests that you can use in, in NIME. I mean, it is a generic data analysis tool after all. We can open up the configuration dialog. We first have to define our grouping column again. That's the class. We actually have to define, can only compare two groups with this node. So I select class A and class B. And now we can actually leave the average sizes and the average intensities both in here. Say, okay, execute this node and take a look at the interactive view, the statistics view here. And we'll actually see, we'll get some descriptive statistics again of the, um, the different properties in the different groups. How many cells do we have per group? What's their, what's the averages and so on. But um, down here, we'll actually um, really see that the test statistics. So for the number of pixels with um, assuming equal variance for the um, two different groups, for the distributions of the two different groups, um, we'll actually um, get a, a p-value here. And for the average intensity, we'll also um, get a p-value here. And we actually see that um, this is much lower, but both are actually way below the um, 0.05 limit for statistical um, significance. So there actually is a statistical, statistically significant difference in the averages when looking at the cell size, but also when looking at the average intensity. And that actually is the end of just giving you a short idea of what you can also do with NIME um, analysis wise. So the, the great thing really here is, and I should really stress it and point that out. Let me um, expand this component here again. Um, so actually right, after the labeling properties note, we have only used generic nine functionality here. So it doesn't really matter where my, where my data comes from that I want to aggregate and generate descriptive statistics about or do a hypothesis about or do the plotting. This really is generic functionality um, that I can use for images that I can use for, I don't know, molecule structures that are supported um, in NIME as well. So that really opens up the really huge box of functionality um, in NIME that you can um, also use your image features on. For example, um, I don't know, training a model that predicts whether a cell belongs to class A or B, depending on how big uh, a cell is, for instance, stuff like that. So we do have nodes in this machine, a lot of nodes in the machine learning um, area as well that you can really just use um, out of the out of the box now. And I think that actually famous last words as in I would now be happy to hand over to Jan to op briefly open up another can of worms, um, namely working with multiple images. Stop sharing my screen. Maybe quickly before yeah. we go to the next topic, there there's two open questions from the audience. If you if you like, please. One question is um, whether you can extend the nuclear mask to measure something in the cytoplasm. Uh, yes, you can. Um, easiest way would be there is a morphological labeling node, for instance, that I could, that I can use to di dilate or erode the masks, basically, yeah, to I extend it or... 
it's called morphological operations as far as uh, remember yeah so it's called working on binary images or on labelings and you can basically mm -hmm. bo on both have uh, opening closing dilating and eroding operations cool thank you and maybe just out of interest another question was um whether um, it's possible to convert the little bit masks or the bit um, that you get from the segment features node as a table mm -hmm. into some other kind of output that makes it easier to export a table like this. Maybe I yeah. can uh, just start with that. So of course, uh, the bit masks that you, that you use from the segment uh, features, they are not necessarily always connected uh, components. So they can be disconnected labelings, whatever. So it's, they are not necessarily polygons. For the connected component analysis, however, they usually, they of course are connected, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. So for, the, for them, um, I don't know if there's a dedicated node to make polygons. I had a use case once uh, where I actually used an image J2 plugin to, to create from the outline, the list of coordinates of the outline. Um, I'm happy to share that. Uh, I will put a link in the Q&A section on the forum then after the seminar. Um, is there yes. anything else, Stefan? And, and they are regular images after all. So there is an image writer node that also uses CIFIO in that case to write the images. And you can actually just dump them into files for further processing, I don't know, PNG files, for instance, if or whatever you like, basically, just because I had that use case recently. All right, um, so just for the last five to 10 minutes, I would uh, like to just uh, tackle an, another topic, working with uh, multiple labelings. As I think Stefan mentioned already uh, before, uh, the, the segmenting or labeling uh, type of images uh, based on the MGLIP2 library, it has the unique property of uh, allowing to store multiple labels for each pixel and we can actually make uh, take advantage of that uh, of that feature uh, let me switch back to to nime and actually the the segmentation workflow that we touched last week uh, I, if I if you remember so this was basically just three images with a very simple uh, cell segmentation as well uh, where if you remember our task uh, that I introduced was not only to segment the nuclei, but also look for the foci of the, this uh, second channel here and count the foci of, uh, of this marker for each nucleus. So in, for, for this case, we basically can do two things. We can segment the nuclei and segment the foci and get a segmentation for, for both of these images. And then uh, there are nodes that allow merging these two uh, labels together. I need to introduce uh, a, well, a few things beforehand. So this is basically just the link to the to the nucleus segmentation workflow that we had last week. And uh, we will add two more nodes now to, to wrap up the session. One is the label transformer because um, we can, so when, when we have a label image, you have num numeric labels from one to the number of components that you have. You can also rename these and make it string-based uh, labeling. So basically, instead of just zero, you can give them any name. And in our case, when we merge labelings, we need to make sh sure that we uh, what we have different labels for the nuclei and different labels for the spot. So we, we will need this one. And um, the, the node that actually generates overlapping labels is this labeling arithmetic node. So I will quickly demonstrate that. To this workflow of uh, last week, I just added another simple segmentation on our uh, first channel, or on the on the marker channel, sorry, on the second channel. Um, if you look closely, I should maybe go to the image viewer here. Um, you see that there are in the, there are small spots um, segmented here, and just small foci from within the, the nuclei. Now, of course, we don't see whether they are within a nucleus and the same nucleus or not. So I will just join these together. Um, let's take this one here, this one there. <clears throat> Mm 
and just draw, join row by row. So now we have the two labelings next to each other. In this column, the nucleus labelings and here the, the, the spot labelings. Now we need this label transformer node. And I will just put it into that connection for the nucleus because we only want to transform the nuclei now. Um, in here, I will configure this node to contain always the name nucleus underscore. And then I have a list of variables here that I can use. I use current label, which means it will just append the current number for each nucleus. If we look at the result from this, we see in the output, we have, if you, if you look at the value column here, you see there are nucleus one, nucleus four, nucleus five. And so that's basically allowing us to now merge these labels with, uh, with, the, with the spot labels by using this label arith labeling arith arithmetics, labeling arithmetic. So here in the options, I will choose by a method, the merge method. It's in, um, explained in the description panel as well, if you want to, to read what, it, what that actually means. And we choose uh, our first labeling and the second labeling, just these two different uh, images that we have created. And the output of this one is uh, a joint labeling with a unique feature that we have for, for every single pixel, we can have multiple labels, multiple sections. So if we go here and look at, for example, this node in, in here in the value column, you see uh, value one and nucleus one. So this is the first spot in the image, but also it belongs to the first nucleus. And down here we have value two and nucleus three. So this is basically uh, in, in, the, in the nucleus without spots, we just have the label nucleus three. This allows us to, to now with the segment features node again, to extract uh, the, the, all the several separate objects by filtering out with uh, only those segments that overlap. Segment features. So I will just use this merged segmentation and channel two image. And here in the settings, we can say append labels of overlapping segments and overlapping segments do not need to completely overlap. And the bottom sections here, we um, allow us to filter either on the labels of the segments that we want to list or on the filter of, on the labels of the overlapping segments. And that's what we want to use here. I gave all the nuclei, the label nucleus something. And then uh, now I put, a, put an asterisk here, which is a wildcard for any, anything that follows. And I'll check contains wildcard here. And just to show you the, the power of, of this uh, approach, we can now in, the, in this node, we'll see a list of all these spot segments with the labels. And also in the label dependencies columns, now we have the name of the nucleus which, uh, with which this spot was overlapping. So basically for this nucleus five, you see that three spots in the original image were in that nucleus five. Below here, there's again a nucleus five. Um, however, it stems from the different file with a, so the two.lsm file. So if we now group by source labeling and by uh, the label dependencies, so by the odd, all the nuclei, we can use this powerful group by node I use that node a lot in all kinds of analysis within NIME. And we'll group by source labeling and label dependencies. And now we will just count the number of spots. So I will take this label column in my uh, aggregation. So I will click manual aggregation, add my label here. And as an aggregation method, I will choose 
the count. So I will just count the occurrences of labels in each group. By doing this, we'll get uh, a table where that allows us for each nucleus to count the number of spots. So for example, here, uh, this nucleus number nine in the last image, it has had six spots. So we can look at the arithmetic here to verify that in our third image, there was one nucleus with six spots. I think it's this one. And uh, you see it had the nucleus nine value label and here these are the six spots. So this was uh, the way to count our spots per, per nucleus. I have to cut it down uh, here because of time limitations. Uh, let me just uh, quickly switch back to what I left open uh, previously. So this cell, cell post segmentation node, it also ran successfully, uh, giving us a new column of a segmentation, um, which worked well on these on these nuclei, also segmenting uh, the, the touching cells fairly well. And um, I think with this one, we'll have to close for now and still be able to uh, to answer a few questions. So the, the workflow I just demonstrated is also available uh, for download or from the NIME hub directly. And with this, let me just wrap up with the conclusions again. I think, um, I hope we, have, we were able to show you the, the nice modular nature of, of NIME and how it helps to, to make reproducible science and batch processing uh, easy and also well-documented with with annotations and uh, grouping component workflows. So are there any questions I'm open still? I can buy us some time and I have a final remark because we had a question also cell pose and Stardust showing up now and I don't know with the image J integration that that is really something that is in that we try to keep and is in NIME's DNA being open to integrations and not trying to reinvent the wheel every time. So I don't know, for example, preparing the, the slides today, I also used image shape for some interactive visualizations or an exploration of parameters and so on, and then put the parameters in a in the NIME workflow, um, just because they're, I mean, different tools are good at different things. Um, so choose the tool, um, that you like, we try to integrate um, as basically as many as we can as a really usable. Um, so you're able to really put them into into one workflow and really an end to end workflow images in and basically data statistics visualizations out. There's a question from the audience now, Jan, which is uh, I tried to connect Omero using NIME Omero Reader node uh, version 5.2, but the login failed. Is this node compatible with the latest version of the Omero server, which is 5.6.3? It's a clear no. Stefan, it, it, it is a no. Um, I, I honestly have to, I would have to look up. So there is, um, there is a released and trusted version of the Omero integration that is compatible with 5.2. We've done some work on that on a, on a nightly update site um, with on an experimental update site that you have to activate. But honestly, the last Omero version that I have tested it on was 5.5. So I'm not entirely sure if it works for um, 5.6, but in order to do that, you'll have to add an additional update site um and um give it a try but we can put the documentation on how to add that update site into the uh, into the follow-up answers and I'll also take a look at it myself thank you and maybe a, as a general remark again please feel free to contact us on the image sc forum or on the nime forum in case of uh, more technical questions for nime and, and for Stefan then possibly, um, but we're always happy to, to answer any, any questions regarding my analysis. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Franca, for the moderation. Thank you, uh, Jan and Stefan, for uh, the, the amazing uh, two sessions you, uh, you gave us. I think it's already the second or third uh, time I follow you presenting uh, uh, nine. Uh, first time uh, online, but each time I learn new stuff and I see the software uh, evolving and bringing new features and, uh, and new tools. It's, it's really, really great. So thank you again for uh, this um, three hours of presentation now. <laughs> With that, I think uh, it's time to say goodbye. And uh, thank see you all. Soon. Thanks for having us. Thanks everyone for okay, attending. Thank you. Have, have, a, have a great day and stay safe, please.